All right, we had a little interruption, but we're picking back up. So, the symptoms that kids would exhibit when they are showing signs of diabetes uh, is they'll start being tired, mainly because the food they're getting isn't being processed properly, and so they're not getting as much energy out of the food as they think you might. Another thing that happens uh, is as the disease progresses, you start getting thirsty and uh, you start to pee lots. Urine output is increased. Now, um, these are things you would notice. Once you go to the doctor, one of the things they'll do is check for glucose in the urine. And that's a really good sign. Uh, another thing that's supposed to happen is the body begins to go into a metabolic state that's known as ketosis. Now, we'll look into this in just a moment as well. All right, so um, first, being tired, the reason you're being ti you're tired uh, um, with diabetes is that you're not getting as much energy as you should. Your body is being a little bit starved for glucose. Let's look at a couple of these things though, because there's some interesting things that come from this. So, let's think about this. Your body has got a, uh, a finite amount of glucose that it can take up at any one time in terms of the kidneys. And if you recall, when we're talking about the kidneys, the blood is being passed through uh, the glomerulus into the Bowman's capsule. Not that you need to worry about that. And you generate what is known as uh, filtrate. Now, filtrate is really P to B. And when your kidneys are processing this, you actually are pulling stuff up and out of the urine. We have one of the main things is a glucose reuptake system. And this glucose reuptake system is limited. There's only so much glucose that it can pull out. And if there's too much glucose in the blood, you can't take it up. So now we have glucose in the urine. All right, now if you recall, we talked about how we can concentrate urine and pull water out. And that's by osmosis. So let's think about this just real quickly with the kidney. We have salt being dumped into the medulla. And as the filtrate is making its way, water is being pulled out. But if you've got glucose in the urine, you're actually fighting against a osmotic gradient where the salt concentration is not higher than the glucose concentration and so your ability to pull water out is now essentially nullified and so you then end up dumping lots of water that is in the form of dilute urine and there you go because you have so much glucose in the blood you can't pull the water out. You are peeing out a lot and you're gonna get thirsty. And so that's one of the reasons why 
the primary symptom of diabetes is increased urine output and glucose in the blood or glucose in the urine. You just can't pull it all out. So you go to the doctor and one of the things they'll do is have you pee in a cup, check to see if there's your glucose in there. If there is, they'll do a blood test. And very often, uh, you might find your blood glucose uh, could be 200, uh, 300 milligrams per deciliter, which is now getting to be pretty darn high. All right, so that's a problem. Now, in order to treat diabetes um, in uh, type 1 diabetes, what you do is you have insulin shots. You take insulin. These days, you know, I don't know if you know anybody that has diabetes. Um, back, you know, 30 years ago, uh, you actually used to take a, a needle and inject yourself with insulin, a little bump of insulin, uh, right before you were going to eat. And the way you primarily uh, you know, have to control this is eating a fairly um, specific diet. It doesn't have to be necessarily high sugar, low sugar. You just want to make sure you know what you're eating kind of uh, consistently. And monitoring blood glucose, taking the insulin shots as, as needed. And it's something that you, uh, you know, you can begin to live with. These days, there's a lot of systems now in which uh, people will wear an insulin pump and actually have a needle that's going into their stomach that they replace like every four or five days and they have a little uh, belt cartridge and you can just pump, um, give yourself a little bump of glucose. It's even now tied into your phone. And so if you know you're about to eat something that's got a lot of sugar in it, you bump yourself up a little bit of um, insulin. One of the things you have to be careful of is taking too much insulin causes you to pull too much glucose out of the blood and that can lead to this diabetic coma. So just from a, uh, a um, a murder mystery perspective, giving somebody a shot at insulin actually is a good way to uh, throw them into a, a coma and potentially kill them because you end up pulling too much glucose out of the blood. All right, so uh, that's the way this thing works. Now, the other part of this has to do with the body going into what's known as Ketosis. Ketosis, you maybe have actually heard about ketogenic diets. Ketosis is a metabolic process that people go into when they're on a zero carbohydrate diet. And if you can't take up blood glucose while you're maybe eating lots of carbohydrate, your body thinks you're on a zero carbohydrate diet. So it's one of the things I think about is, you know, uh, a person, an untreated diabetic, is essentially on a ketogenic diet. They just don't know it. And because they are not just eating uh, no sugar, they are eating everything, their blood glucose goes up. And in fact, uh, because your body has the ability to generate glucose, you're always going to have a blood glucose level. And ketosis is what happens when you're on a zero carb diet. All right, so this is actually going to lead us into some ideas about nutrition and diets, which is actually pretty interesting. One final point before we get into the ketosis and the ketogenic diet issue is to address what is becoming a fairly common um, chronic condition, particularly among adults, and that is what's known as adult onset diabetes. This is known as type 2. Uh, type 1 diabetes, another term for it, is also known as insulin dependent. This is typically not insulin dependent. Uh, type 2 diabetes actually is a little bit simpler kind of condition and one you can kind of reverse. It happens when you have uh, excessive amount of carbohydrate and 
partly due to diet, partly due to weight, all kinds of things, and your body just becomes insensitive to insulin. It's not that you have an autoimmune disease where you're not producing insulin, you just now become insensitive to insulin. So being insensitive to insulin makes it so your body's not able to respond to increased blood glucose. All right. So uh, people that have type, type 2 diabetes, they may be given insulin, but generally what they're doing is changing their diet and being encouraged to lose weight, and that usually clears it up. But that leads us to this next idea about different kinds of diets, because you perhaps have heard of uh, low carbohydrate or low glycemic diets. And there's some interesting things going on here. So let's, let's look at a couple of different ideas. Uh, so the low carb diet, and this is also the low glycemic index diet. Uh, this actually ends up being very similar to what's known as the Atkins diet. Um, there's no one that was a big deal back in the uh, uh, early 2000s called the South Beach diet. And these are all focused on reducing the amount of carbohydrate that you're taking. So what you can do is mimic some of the conditions of a diabetic by reducing carbohydrate intake. And I've never been on a, uh, a zero carb diet long enough for this to happen. Um, you have to be on a zero carb diet for probably oh, seven to 10 days in order to shift your metabolism into what's known as ketosis. And it's a different way of metabolizing biomolecules and you actually end up uh, having a breath that smells a little bit like acetone, which I think can be kind of cool, nail polish remover, regardless. This is how it works. We know that we can eat a variety of different kinds of biomolecules. You can eat fatty acids, fats. You can eat proteins. You can break those down. You can eat carbohydrates. Now we've talked about the breakdown of glucose a lot. We had the musical. But what about the breakdown of proteins and fats? Let's look at that for a second. When we break down proteins and fats, They can't start in the uh, beginnings of metabolism the way glucose does with glycolysis. Proteins and fats aren't broken down in glycolysis. Proteins and fats are all broken down starting with the Krebs cycle. Now, if you recall, this is not a bad place to start because the bulk of the energy that's being pulled out of the molecules, the food molecules, is happening in the Krebs cycle. Glycolysis is only responsible for two ATPs per glucose. What we're going to do now is essentially start with the two carbon uh, acetyl-CoA and begin working from that direction. And that's really where the bulk of the energy in glucose is being pulled out. And so it's like this. When you want to break down proteins and fats, turn them into calories. What we do is you pop off two carbons and that goes into the Krebs cycle. And there are a couple of interesting things that start to happen here. Uh, first off, uh, with proteins, it's actually fairly easy to describe this. You break proteins down in the stomach and in the small intestine into amino acids. Now let's have a big throwback back to the uh, probably the second or third week of our discussion, and that was the structure of the amino acid. You remember this, of course? Well, maybe not. It looks like this. You got the amine group and the carboxylic acid group, and then there was this side chain called the R group. What you do to process amino acids is actually pretty darn simple. You pop the amine group off, beep, 
you pop the R group off, beep, and you're left with this two carbon molecule, and guess what? That can be converted into acetyl-CoA, two carbons, goes directly into the Krebs cycle. So when you're eating a lot of protein, you generate a fair amount of nitrogen that goes into nitrogenous waste, urea. So if you're going to be on a zero-carb, high-protein diet, kind of like the Atkins diet, um, you need to be drinking a lot of water, you need to have healthy kidneys, and it's something that you need to be thoughtful about in terms of how well your kidneys are working because you're putting a pretty serious load on your kidneys in terms of removing all this nitrogen. But it works. Uh, with fats, it's actually uh, a similar kind of thing. Fatty acids uh, are broken down really just two carbons at a time and into the Krebs cycle. And so you can get by uh, eating just fats or a very high fat diet just fine as well. But that's the way we think about these things. All right, so now from here, we got one last little point. If you're on a uh, intentional zero carb diet, if you recall, we mentioned that you it's not consistent with life to have a blood glucose of um, below 70 milligrams per deciliter. So a question then is, um, a low carb diet or a zero carb diet, where do you get glucose? You have to maintain a blood glucose level. So where does it come from if it's not coming from diet? Glad you asked. There is a biochemical synthesis process that is known as gluconeogenesis. And this is the ability to actually biosynthesize glucose. So no matter what you eat, protein, fat, you can convert that in to glucose. So your body is not going to be um, running low of glucose. You just maintain it. So this ties us into yet another really cool diet idea. And it is a notion of why a high fat, high protein diet is actually pretty good. And it's this. People that go on real extreme caloric restricted diets are typically going to be on a zero sugar diet. They're going to be going on a ketogenic diet. And the reason you do this is by not introducing sugar into the body, you're relying on gluconeogenesis to maintain your blood glucose level. And you're more likely to not have these spikes and drops of blood glucose that on a really low calorie diet would make you feel really weak. So here is a way to think about glucose release in um, insulin release like this. Let's look at sort of a combo chart in which we've got time here and we're going to draw on this axis uh, blood glucose and insulin. Maybe we should have done blood glucose in red, blood red, whatever. But it's like this. Um, your blood glucose level, we're going to set it right here. at 70. We're not going to um, put insulin units in here. We're just going to say insulin's up or down. So, all right, it is uh, 7 a.m. or so, whenever you wake up, 10, no one's judging. Your blood glucose is going to be kind of low. All right, 
Now we're going to have breakfast. The most important meal of the day. I don't eat breakfast, whatever. And you have um, a bagel, you know, with some jelly. You very quickly convert that flour into glucose. And here comes your blood glucose levels going up. Now, as blood glucose levels go up, insulin is going to get the signal and it's going to go up as well. That causes blood glucose to start going down and insulin now will come down as well. All right, so your blood glucose starts to go down. We won't make you that as much. Um, and you start to get kind of hungry. Well, fortunately, it's lunchtime. So you're gonna have uh, a sandwich and a Dr. Pepper. That's going to have your blood glucose go up. And of course, we're gonna get another spike of insulin. And that causes the cells to take up glucose that goes down. Oh, you need a nap, but all right, it's gonna kind of stabilize out. And it's supper time. And of course, we're eating uh, pasta, and then you have to have some ice cream. Blood glucose goes up, and of course, insulin spikes up as well. All right. Blood glucose goes down, and it's bedtime. This is a typical blood glucose insulin pathway pattern that eating just sort of a standard diet you might have. What if you were on a uh, zero-carb diet? You're depending on gluconeogenesis to keep your blood glucose levels reasonably stable. So you wake up, you eat a little bit, your blood glucose goes up, but because you're not eating sugar, it's going to kind of stay here. And you don't get these real insulin spikes. The idea is a zero carb diet, rather than having blood glucose spikes, we end up having a bit more smooth transition throughout the day. Another thing you can do, and this is what I think of as my famous pixie stick diet, which people have tried and I'm not sure how well it works, is that rather than eating the traditional three meals a day, you snack throughout the day. You take your calories and you just spread them out throughout the day so you don't have these spikes. You eat a little bit here, you eat a little bit there, you eat a little bit here, you eat a little bit there, and maybe you don't have uh, any one really big meal. So that's another way of thinking about this. And uh, one of the things this means is that by eating a diet with a fair amount of sugar in it, which I'm sad to say my diet probably has a lot of carbohydrate in it, you end up with these spikes and then with these crashes, and the spikes and crashes. And what you want to do is keep things humming along. Um, that's the way we probably should be thinking about a more healthy, nutritious diet. Now, what this means is we probably should be getting the bulk of our calories from fat and protein. And it's one of the things I still go, hmm, about is that we are still seeing advertisements for low-fat food low-fat milk, low-fat cottage cheese, zero-fat yogurt, when what you should be looking at is full-fat everything. Now, you have to be thoughtful about the number of calories you take in in one day, and foods that have fats are calorically dense. So you have to have sort of a set number of calories that you're looking to hit, but those calories really should be from fats and proteins, not so much from simple sugars. So it's one of the things that just aggravates the heck out of me is going to the grocery store and seeing all of these low-fat products. 
we don't want to eat low fat. And the whole, you know, standard nutrition lore is, oh, you should avoid fat. You know, like back when we were looking at labels, we've got the fat content. That should be irrelevant. It's the calorie content. You should be getting your calories from fat. And it's one of the things that still aggravates me about the USDA's uh, food pyramid, the nutrition pyramid, is that they've got fats sparingly. No, we should be eating carbohydrates and sparingly and eating fats. Now, one of the things about carbohydrates, as we talked about at the very beginning of the class, is not all carbohydrates are the same. Some carbohydrates, like white flour, that are really refined, they're broken down very quickly into glucose. But other carbohydrates, like in the form of complex grains, are being broken down much more slowly. And so, it was actually kind of an invention I had of a time-release glucose tablet, but I think somebody actually, they make this stuff. But that would be another interesting way to consume material where you have glucose, like in some kind of tablet or a bar, that is coated in something that it slowly is released and it's just releasing glucose over a long period of time. Those of you that exercise, I don't know if we have any triathletes in the group, you probably have little glucose cubes that you take during a race as a way of maintaining your blood glucose when you're really exercising hard. Uh, those of us that don't exercise all that hard um, don't need to be eating that much, blood gluco uh, that much glucose, and so you just need to be uh, controlling the amount of calories that you consume. But there are ways of changing your caloric in input that will actually make you feel a bit better. These spikes are what lead to me around 5 o'clock getting all grumpy and hangry as I'm hungry and angry. Uh, if I eat a bit more consistently, I can maintain my blood glucose and not be nearly as crabby come five o'clock. Uh, just ask my family, no, don't. All right, so that's the bottom line then, is that we probably should be getting the bulk of our calories from fats and proteins, and carbohydrates can certainly be in there, but if you're gonna eat carbohydrate, you need to eat a little bit of it throughout the day. So if you're gonna be on your ice cream diet or your pixie stick diet, that's fine. Just don't try to do it three meals a day. Try to spread it all the way around. If you're gonna be eating um, fats and proteins, you probably can do a bit more of a three meal a day thing. Um, just have to be thoughtful that you're getting enough calories. Now one of the things I find is that uh, you perhaps have experienced this feeling of being really weak and tired and weepy because you're hungry. And I'm not immune to it, but what I try and do is tell my liver, all right, yes, I'm hungry and tired. Yes, I'm feeling sad, but you know we have plenty of glucose stores in the body. Let's just get them out and get them moving again. It doesn't always work. One of the things that I still haven't figured out this either is that um, when you get a real fear, um, a blast, your body secretes adrenaline, and that causes a massive dump of glucose into your body, into your bloodstream, sort of the fight or flight response. And that's one of the things I think about when you're starting to feel really tired and low glucose. If there's a way you could give yourself a frightening jolt, you'd feel better, but that's hard to do. Coffee kind of works, but not exactly. All right, that's it for today. And uh, we'll probably have another lecture or so to finish up. And then our exam um, will open up on Friday. And we'll see where we go from there. All right, guys. Thanks.